who's all excited because there might be a present or two already under the tree or somebody went shopping or grandma told them something's in the mail or something like that. The anticipation and the excitement, knowing that God did fulfill his word and that the Savior did come and our, our debt to God has been paid in full. So there is still that confession and repentance, that message of John the Baptist, but there's also a joy along with it that God fully kept his promise, kept his word, and the Savior did what was necessary to fully forgive you and me. The theme of our third weekend in Advent worship. The order is printed for us and will be projected as well as we have been doing uh, for several months now. If you would please uh, highlight all the announcements in the bulletin uh, with the extra services starting uh, very soon with uh, Christmas services and New Year's services and things like that. And because of that, this is actually the last Saturday night service for the calendar year. Uh, next weekend, we don't have the Saturday one. And then the weekend after that, right, the day after Christmas, we don't have that one. We have the regular Sunday services, but the next two Saturdays in December and actually the 2nd of January, since we'll also have December 31st, 1st, and 3rd would be church. So it's actually going to be uh, four, four Saturdays from today before we have another Saturday service. But check all the announcements, please, in the bulletin for schedules and other things that are still going on even in, in COVID kind of times. After the bell is rung, we begin our Advent worship with the responsive speaking of those Advent candle responses. <clears throat> We worship in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. We light one Advent candle, remembering Jesus, who is coming again. He will come to gather his people from everywhere, both the living and the dead. We hear his call to watch. We light two Advent candles, remembering Jesus, who came in history. He came into a world of sin and death. We hear his call to repent. We light three Advent candles, Remembering Jesus, the light of the world, he came to defeat the prince of darkness. We hear his call to see the light. We light four Advent candles, remembering Jesus, the Son of God and Son of Mary. He came to share our humanity. We hear his call to give him a place in our hearts. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. Through your word and spirit, may our souls be blessed. First hymn we sing this weekend in the hymnal, it's number seven. Rejoice, rejoice, believers.
God created us to love and serve him as his dear children. However, all people have rebelled against God's perfect and holy will and brought sin and death into this world. Christ alone is the ransom price, and he alone is the Redeemer. Let us confess our sins and trust in God's grace and mercy. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature sinful, for faithless worrying and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me from your presence forever. I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Amen. Christ has died, is risen, and will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ, even when we were dead in our sins. Therefore, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. May be seated. The lessons this weekend once again begin with a lesson from the Old Testament book of Isaiah, today from chapter 61. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God. For he has clothed me with garments of salvation and arrayed me in a robe with his righteousness. As a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makes the sprout come up and the garden causes seeds to grow, so the Sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. The second lesson is from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians from chapter 5, kind of a, a checklist, so to speak, both preparing to celebrate Christ's birth properly and also preparing ourselves for that unknown last day, reading beginning at verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is God's word. We stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel today recorded by the Apostle John, verses from chapter 1. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. Now this was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely, I'm not the Messiah. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. 
Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him. Why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? I baptize with water, John replied. But among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. This all happened at Bethany, on the other side of the Jordan, where John was baptizing. This is God's word. We join together in speaking the verse of the day. Alleluia. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Alleluia. And we join to confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. The hymn of the day for this weekend, number 14 in the hymnal, Arise, O Christian People.
Please rise. Grace and peace be in you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God upon which we shall meditate is from our epistle lesson for this evening. Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 5, beginning at verse 16. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything, hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. This is God's word. Please be seated. Dear Christians, everybody who gets a little mileage on themselves with age knows the truth that good, ha good habits are harder to learn than bad habits. It takes self-discipline, takes some responsibility. But you struggle with it. My, fa my uh, fellow diabetics and I understand about daily practices of discipline and responsibility, keeping track of that blood sugar, keeping track of diet, trying to do that daily exercise. We also know the difficulty of making that transition from knowledge over to doing. Get together with my doctor regularly. And there are times she says to me, you know, John, maybe it'd do you some good to go back and see the diabetic nurse and get some more information and counseling. And of course, this is when the pastor is maybe a little bit too smart for his good, and he says, I have that sermon memorized. The sermon isn't the problem. It's me doing the sermon. And uh, that's true with the diabetic nurse. <laughs> I fortunately have been doing better than previously, but... I still have my shortfallings. <clears throat> I could do better, that, that's for sure. Apostle Paul here is, at the end of this letter, is encouraging Thessalonians to some good Christian habits. But, you know, you got to get from where he's telling you about it to where you're actually then doing it. But uh, God's Word has a lot more power packed into it than uh, the counseling advice of the diabetic nurse. Because the Holy Spirit is working with the Word. And so, a greater advantage there for sure. But certainly we also need to be aware ourselves, just ourselves, it's a, it is a struggle to get from one to the other. And day, and day, day by day we seek to do that. We were in that struggle. So, we need to go back to that word, and we need to keep focus on Christ, because that's where the motivation is, isn't it? And anytime you try to establish a habit that's a good habit, you got to have the motivation. It, it, it is critical. Now, as Paul is talking to the Thessalonians, they need motivation. They are suffering under persecution from some of the local Jewish people. And that persecution is going to the extent of physical uh, abuse, going to the extent of they're dying for the faith. And now, with that understanding, consider that Paul says to them, be joyful always. I know you're dying, I know you're being, be joyful always. Oh, come on, Paul. That's like telling us today in the face of the virus and riots and looting and crime and increase and all these other things, be joyful always. It's hard. Talk to the daughter. She's living up in, up in Hennepin County with her family in a, in a good part of uh, the city up there. But still, they're shut down tight. They're not going anywhere. She longs for those days when she gets to be the one to go to Costco and do the grocery shopping so she can get out of the house <laughs> and get away from the work and get away from the virtual school and all that other stuff. 
She's, you can tell she's getting a little bit frayed on the uh, edges there. Be joyful always. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? But the Lord, of course, is not asking for something here that he doesn't provide. And we do have that joy. We celebrate at this time of year, don't we? It's about Christ coming into this world. And it's about Christ being the great motivation. Can consider our foundation, right? And it's a solid foundation. Jesus describes it. It's that, it's that rock in the storm. The guy who built that house on the rock, and it weathers all, everything that comes against it. The winds, the storms, you name it. And why? We Christians have the best motivation there is. Christ is risen. We are forgiven. Christ is risen. We get to rise with him and live forever. That's a guarantee. That's an absolute. That's ours beyond a shadow of a doubt. That part is done, that part is ours. So on that foundation, that's where the joy is. And that which we'll be rejoicing in again this Christmas, yeah, in a modified way, still the same Savior, still the same Lord, still the same salvation, thank God. And probably, you know, some sage advice, and we can go back to Thanksgiving for this, because we often speak in this way, count your blessings. You know, it really does work. <laughs> to go back and reflect and look at how God has worked with you through his word, how God has worked with you through the prayers that he's answered for you, how he's handled them for you, and to go back and remember, yeah, the Lord is there as he's promised that he would be there, word and sacrament, the way he has showed up there in life. And then you face your present difficulties. But you face it with the Lord. He's there. He is the good shepherd. He is leading the way. And especially when we face this one particular distress, which Paul will also talk to the Thessalonians about it's in the previous chapter, but it's when we confront death. When one of our loved ones dies, our loved ones especially in Christ, he told those Christians in Thessalonica, Brothers, we do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. Notice Paul is accepting the reality there. You're going to grieve. You're going to have loss in the face of death. You are going to miss that person, and you're going to probably miss them for many years maybe till the day that you die. You're not going to just forget what happened. But you see, you have something else that's there as well, too, when that person is in Christ. Their death really wasn't the end for them. You see, to, to die is Christ, and to live is gain. And we gain. We gain through death. Isn't that the, the great joy that despite going through that, we do go through it to the other side in Christ. It's there. And it's the greater thing. And what happens in this world is temporary, but what the Lord has set in place is forever. And that's what sets all of these other things that Paul says, do this always. Do this continually. Do this in all circumstances. That's how we can do those things. Because certainly when Paul says here, pray continually, he doesn't mean 24 hours a day, okay? There's no way. We've got to sleep sometime. Let's face it. But it means that we can go to God anytime. And that God wants us to pray to him at any time, anywhere, with any words. He's open 24-7. He's the one that's always there. And so we can go anytime and we can come to him and we can lay everything on our heart before God. He wants us to. And that shows his great love to us, doesn't it? 
We know that he knows all things, but he knows we need to talk to him. We need to unload. We need to cast our cares upon him. And certainly what, wants, what Paul wants us to know in this, in this prayer, yet yes, we can do the formal prayers like the Lord's prayers and other things, but you can just pray from the heart at any time. God isn't going to grade you on punctuation and spelling and syntax and whether you got your paragraphs worked out in the right order. You just give it to him as it comes out. And he is simply fine with that. And also to remember this, that you're his child, your prayers are always good enough in Christ, no matter what. Sometimes we get the idea that, well, my life hasn't been the greatest and, and maybe I could have done things better. I had more. I have more bad habits than I have my good habits. And uh, sometimes we get too humble about praying or too scared of praying because we're thinking God won't accept anything. But he will accept it. When we lean on him, when we throw our faith into him, Many times we as pastors will get requests to say prayers for other people, which is fine. We love doing that. Sometimes it gets thrown in there. But pastor, God will hear your prayer before he hears mine because you're so much closer to God than what I am. And Pastor Schultz and I will smile and go, you're just as close to God and Christ as any other Christian. Go to him. He's going to listen to you. Feel free to do that. That's what he sent Christ for at Christmas time. That's why Christ died. That's why he rose again. You've got a direct line to heaven. I once took this young lady through uh, uh, Bible information classes a number of years ago already. Uh, and uh, with her religious background, she did prayers to the saints with her two little girls. And then we went through a Bible instruction, and uh, we read the verse, and there's one mediator between Christ, between God and men, and it's Christ Jesus. And she turned to me and she said, You mean to say that I can go straight to the top, nobody in between, and, and he's going to listen to me? I said, absolutely, that's, that's what it says. Well, I'm going to make use of that. <laughs> I mean, it was just like, uh, and I, I'm sure that the good Lord's ear got bent a lot after that by that young mom. But, I mean, that's uh, just, remember, you have that access. It's always there. It's always there all the time. Now, of course, getting into that good habit. That always takes time, doesn't it? Start small, work on it. Maybe you need to do it first thing in the morning when you're getting up and you're still laying in the bed for a couple of seconds, or maybe it's just before you go to sleep at night and you have maybe a little trouble getting to sleep, and hey, say your prayer in there. Maybe it's with your morning coffee that you could do it. Maybe it's your daily walk or walking your pet, you could do it. Maybe, you know, you could, while you're driving in the car, turn off everything else, except your car, of course, <laughs> and say a prayer while you're driving. And just get it out there from your heart. I uh, had this uh, one uh, farm lady who was a member, and uh, she kept a notepad in her kitchen, and as she would go through on her trips, you know, in, in and out of the house, etc., something would come to mind to pray on, and she'd write a little bit on her notepad, and it came to evening, and, and uh, it was on a sticky note. And she stuck it on the window over the kitchen sink, and as she did dishes, she did her prayers. She, she found a place to put it, right? And, uh, and that's kind of a part of it, to, to make a search. Where can I get this in? Yeah, it only has to be a couple minutes. But once you start doing that, it'll grow on you because... The Spirit likes that sort of thing. 
and with encouragement from the Word, it'll be there. It'll happen. And then, of course, look for the Lord's answers. They'll come. Not the answers you're suggesting to Him, although you probably would like to see them. Look for God's answers, please. They're always better than ours, as I've found out numerous times in my life but they're the best answers ever. Okay, so you're, you're into this now, the, the joyful foundation, you've got the prayer line, and giving thanks in all circumstances. For these Thessalonians, that had to be a difficult challenge. It's a difficult challenge, really, in anybody's life, because there's always things that are happening. Again, you go back to that count your blessings sort of thing, but in remembering that and especially in the situation we are now in our country and all the things that are out there to remember God told us this was a perishing world okay and that it's going to be in that condition and finally at some point the entire world of course will be gone in fire what's going to remain his word and you and me his redeemed children that's what's going to remain Okay, there'll be a new heavens and a new earth, okay? But we're coming through on the other side. That's going to remain. First thanks, we're, we're in that flock that Jesus has redeemed. Thank God for that. While we're here, we have a Lord that understands. He sympathizes. Thank God for that. We have a Lord who, who sits at the right hand of God, still has his human body, and he gets grieving, he gets mourning, he gets pain, he gets sadness, he gets it about tears and suffering death. All of those things. He just doesn't talk about it, he's lived it. Isn't that great to know? That this is a Lord that understands and then is willing to lead us in our lives with his word and sacrament and have us come out on the other end. And so then, keeping things going. This is where Paul takes us to when he says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. And the things that he lists there after that, just think about it now. Isn't this really a restatement of the guide of the first three commandments in our relationship with our Lord? Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything Hold on to the good, avoid every kind of evil. Would fit right in with all the parables in the New Testament where Jesus says, be alert, watch, prepare. Right? And it, this tells us that we, as God's redeemed, get that life of faith from him. And now he's saying, all right, guys, now live it. You get to live it. You get to live that out. And one thing that should encourage us and give us joy is that we got that life to live. This is what he's telling us. You've, you, you, you are going to do these things which I have enabled to do. That means I've given you that life, and that means you know you need to now carry on and do this. Great, isn't it? Let's go back to the doctor's office again. And uh, certainly any number, again, of us have been in that doctor's office in a more serious situation and maybe we're looking at treatment or recuperating from a surgery or whatever it might be and uh, the doctor goes through the list of do's and don'ts that we're going to have to <laughs> follow maybe for the next months maybe for the next years and he's not doing it to pick on it. he's not doing, a, doing it to make our lives miserable He's doing it because he wants us to have a better life, doesn't he? He's, he's giving us some guides there to follow. And that, this is what Paul is doing here, and certainly how we as Christians can use the law as a guide. The Lord's giving us insight here. Hey, here's how you live out that life I've given you now. Here are the guidelines for that. And of course, Paul is emphasizing here, it all begins with Christ. It all begins with what he's done with us, and it all begins with his word and his sacraments. Use that. Your life is founded in that. 
now live that life out here are same things to do yes this is work just as much as when you get any of your advice from your doctor it is work hey this is life okay and perhaps as we remind ourselves of some of the things that Paul encourages us to do to keep focus on Christ. Haven't done a lot of them a whole lot as good as I should have. Maybe I've actually fallen on my face more than once. But in forgiveness, we as children of God can get up again. The Lord helps us to get up again, to carry on, to keep on living, and to live out that Christian life. We live by grace. We live by his love. And that's what Paul ends up here with, really. He's reminding us, here's your source, here's your life, and guess who enables you to do all these things? It's the Lord all the way along. And that gives us that confidence, doesn't it? May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Paul takes you back to the foundation. God's faithfulness. Go back to that. He will do it. Go back to that. It's his promise in Christ. He's going to be there for you. He can't back out. He can't renege. He's committed. He sent Jesus at Christmas. He already came. He is coming again because he rose again. And he did that all for us. And so we can focus on Christ. And we can look forward to Christmas this year again. And we can look forward to that next time, that second Christmas, of Christ returning for us. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God surpasses all understandings. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now keep, continue standing for prayer. Eternal Father, throughout the centuries, you repeated and affirmed your promise to send the offspring of the woman to crush the serpent's head. Through your prophets of old, you continually directed the eyes of your people to the advent of their Savior. We praise you, Lord, for keeping your promise and sending your Son to destroy the works of the devil. As we prepare to celebrate the birth of our King, use your mighty word to shatter our pride and to rouse us from spiritual slumber and apathy. Move us to take to heart the words of John. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. You sent your Son to redeem us from sin. Let this good news be our joy and strength. Use it to cheer the lonely, encourage the fearful, and give hope to the despairing. In these days before Christmas, spare us from the stress of deadlines and the frenzy of commercialism. Fill our lives with the message of your peace and the music of your grace. Direct our eyes not only to the manger, but also to the skies, where we will see your Son coming again, not as a lowly child, but as the Lord of lords. Lift up our hearts in joyful anticipation of that day. Lord, we pray for those brothers and sisters of ours in the faith, our fellow members here at church, our family members, our neighbors, our friends, anyone who's undergoing illnesses, injuries, are suffering with any kind of ailment at this time. We ask, Lord, that you would calm their restless hearts and that you would comfort, strengthen, and illumine them with the sweet peace born of your love and keep them in the way of peace, especially during these difficult and trying times in their lives. Lord Jesus, we also confess that because of our many sins, we are unworthy to receive this sacrament. But we praise and thank you for your amazing grace and your wondrous love which led you to leave your spot in heaven to come to this earth to be our substitute and live perfectly in our place, die innocently as our sacrificial lamb, and rise triumphantly for us. We believe through your word and the Spirit's power this bread is your body which carried all our sins to the cross. 
and this wine is your blood shed for the forgiveness of all our sins. May this eating and drinking be a blessing to us to eternal life. Hear us, Lord, as we join again to pray as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Please be seated. We'll distribute in the back and also starting here on the, the lectern side as we've been doing to receive the sacrament in front for the others. Please stand for the prayer. We join together in praying the prayer of the day. Hear our prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, and come with the good news of your mighty deliverance. Drive the darkness from our hearts 
and fill us with your light. For you live and reign with the Father and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. May the Lord go before you to guide you. May the Lord go behind you to encourage you. May the Lord go alongside you to support you. May the Lord go above you to shield you. And may the Lord go beneath you to lift you up in his loving arms. Amen. May be seated as we close our worship. It's hymn number 12 in the hymnal. Hark the glad sound, the Savior comes. Amen. 